In case you missed it, we are excited to announce that the Curbsiders are now partnering with VCU Health Continuing Education to offer CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information to create your free account and start claiming CE credit today. This episode you're about to hear is our third and final show for Neff Madness 2020. This is a special crossover episode featuring our own Cyrus Askin interviewing the crew from the Freely Filtered podcast, which of course features our chief of nephrology at Cashlack, Joel Toff, and also prominently features Dr. Samira Farouk, who is an expert in transplant nephrology. And finally, be sure to fill out your brackets before the deadline this Wednesday, April 30th, 2020, and be sure to sign up with the Curbsiders as your team. Welcome to a very special episode of Freely Filtered with special guests, the Curbsiders. Freely Filtered is the increasingly regular podcast that summarizes and discusses recent NEFJC journal clubs. NEFJC is the Twitter Nephrology Journal Club where nephrologists meet in social space to discuss the articles that are driving nephrology forward. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not intended to give medical advice. If you have questions about your health, you should talk with your doctor before making any medical decision. This podcast will discuss off-label indications for medications. Hello, my name is Joel Toff, but most people know me as Kidney Boy. Tonight, I'm joined by the full filtrate. Swap? Hi, I'm Swapnit Hiramat. I'm a nephrologist and epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa in Canada. I'm a co-founder. I'm the co-founder of the NEFJC Nephrology Journal Club, and I tweet at H. Swapnil. Jenny? I'm Jenny Lin. I'm a physician scientist and attending nephrologist at Northwestern University. I tweet at Jenny J. Lin. Samira? I'm Samira Farouk, transplant nephrologist at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. I tweet at S.S. Farouk. Matt? Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Sparks. I'm a nephrologist at Duke University, and I tweet at nephro underscore sparks. Cyrus, why don't you introduce yourself? Howdy, y'all. So super pumped to be here. Uh, Glad to represent the Curbsiders. I'm sure that uh, Matt and Stuart um, and Paul send their condolences off there uh, in the trenches fighting COVID-19 and what have you. Uh, I happen to be um, one of the original correspondents or slash producers uh, that the boys brought on uh, many moons ago. And so again, happy to be here. Um, My day job is that of a pulmonary and critical care fellow in San Antonio at a major academic uh, medical center. Before starting fellowship, I was a chief resident um, for my um, my residency, um, and of course, that means I was an internal medicine resident at one point, not too too long ago. Initially, with an interest in actually doing nephrology and critical care, but when I found out that that wasn't going to be an easy option um, for my career field, um, I found myself in pulmonary and critical care, which I'm I'm very happy with. You know, I unfortunately the only thing I really remember about the kidneys or know about the kidneys is the difference between a 4K and a 2K bath. <laughs> So we have maybe I'll learn. We have some fellowship spots if you want to apply for next year. Oh, outstanding! I would love to stay in training forever and ever and ever. Well, and what? And I have a lot of respect for pulmonary. It's another one of those twin organs. You got a right and left lung, right and left kidney. Pretty much similar things. That's right. That's right. It's a it's a great field. I'm 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 very fortunate to be able to um to be a part of it, particularly now um, with everything that's going on kind of worldwide. So yeah, got to blow off that CO two somehow. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. So, to, so tonight we're going to be talking about a Neff Madness. This is, I think, the third Neff Madness uh, Curbsiders episode. Uh, this one we're going to be doing uh, uh, transplant for the internist is what we'll be talking about. There's a region on transplant. And what we'll be talking about is kind of general transplant issues. And at the end of the episode, we're going to go through and do a quick discussion of the uh, four teams in the in the region and make our picks. So Cyrus, do you want to start us off with the case? Absolutely. Mr. K.S. Wilson, so hopefully someone gets the joke there, K.S. Wilson, is a 48-year-old male with a past medical history of poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension, previously diagnosed with CKD3, who has been lost to follow-up over the last several years. He presents in the emergency department with shortness of breath and is noted to have several electrolyte abnormalities also appears in a sarcic on exam. He states that he has not been urinating as much over the last several weeks, during which time he's developed the swelling in his arms and legs, as well as some fatigue and malaise. 
Labs are notable for a serum creatinine of 6.2, a BUN of 97, a bicarb of 14, and a potassium of 6.3. EKG is notable for LVH without ST or T wave changes at this point. He is ultimately admitted and started on dialysis with significant resolution of his symptoms. He tolerates this well, and he's eventually able to discharge. Fast forward, Mr. Wilson ends up on Monday, Wednesday, Friday hemodialysis, to which he's exceptionally adherent. He follows regularly with his internist as a nephrologist, and he's just doing so much better. After three years of hemodialysis via right upper extremity AVF, he inquires about kidney transplant. And so with that, I'll open with my first question as uh, someone who's always going to be a general internist at heart. What are the indications for renal transplant? What are the, the top reasons why someone might get a renal transplant? And what do we think about uh, Mr. Wilson's chances at getting a kidney? Yes, yeah, so those are all important questions, and especially I think for the internist to ask because the internist actually probably has the first opportunity to um, maximize a patient's chances of actually getting to a successful kidney transplant. So the first question, what are the indications for kidney transplant? Um, my short answer to that would be chronic kidney disease. Um, and I say chronic kidney disease and not end-stage kidney disease because the most successful kidney transplants are those that are what we call preemptive. So someone that has not yet reached dialysis. So in the patient that you've told us a little bit about, we're a little bit kind of behind in a sense. Um, but in, our, in an ideal situation, we want early referrals from the nephrologist to the kidney transplant center. We begin that evaluation process as soon as we can. And as soon as there's one GFR value that is less than 20, a patient is eligible to be on the kidney transplant wait list, and that would be an, an ideal time to start thinking about living kidney donation if that is an opportunity um, for the particular patient. Um, so we work a lot with our, our nephrologists, um, and we tr try to train our nephrology fellows that one of the things that they should be thinking about when they're seeing patients in the uh, clinic for CKD management and follow-up is that if they do have that GFR criteria that is either below 20 or even approaching 20 to really get the ball rolling for a kidney transplant referral because we do feel that that is one kind of bottleneck that can lead to low kidney transplantation rates. Yeah, that script, illness script that you gave is really, it's kind of heartbreaking for us because you say that this is typical and it just has so many uh, poor evidences of poor care. Like we don't like to start people on dialysis when they get admitted with symptomatic renal failure. This is somebody that should have been caught way upstream, way before they had a creatinine of six, and get uh, an access place long before that, get referred to transplant long before they go on dialysis. You know, one of the things that 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 I see over and over again is when they can get they can get eligible for a kidney transplant at a GFR of 20. And that's not six months before they go on dialysis. That's not a year before go, they go on dialysis. That is years before they will run out of GFR and need to be on dialysis. And that's that. those years are just, A, opportunities to get a transplant, and B, they are a time when they uh, they start bur moving up the list. So by the time they start on transplant, they already have two or three years already under their belt because transplant lists, are unfortunately, are long and you know, I think it's worth mentioning that I don't think many people realize how long the kidney transplant evaluation process really is. And that's not only patients, but also the the uh, people who are referring them to us. And so um, in an ideal world, I would say that we can complete an evaluation for kidney transplant pending everything goes perfectly, all the scheduling goes perfectly, all the tests are normal, um, maybe within a six-month period. And I think that would be a generous um, estimate. And so even if you refer us at a GFR of around 20, by the time they've completed the testing and are actually ready for the transplant, it may actually be um, a, a year or two from that. And our many of our screening tests, which include cardiac screening, screening for malignancies, we do um, routine lab work, and that often does reveal underlying disease that then has to be dealt with. And so kind of a classic example is someone comes in, we do a cardiac evaluation, find that they need a stent, they're on, um, on antiplatelet agents, and now even if they have a living donor, that procedure has now been postponed because of the evaluation workup that's pending. And so our kind of our main message is always kind of refer them to us early. Let the kidney transplant evaluation team, which consists of a nephrologist, a surgeon, dietitian, social worker, coordinator, let our entire team make the decision of whether a patient is a candidate or not. Because we have also seen from our experience at our own center with our trainees is that often. Um, the physician will like to say that this patient is not eligible for a reason that they 
think is um, is appropriate. So either I think the patient's too sick, or I think the patient is does not meet X criteria. Um, but we're more than happy to to be a part of that evaluation process and um, take it from there. One of the other things about the script that I just wanted to point out is uh, he, it was three years from the time that he started dialysis that he got referred. And um, one of the cha- recent changes to the way the uh, transplant lists work is he starts acquiring time on the list from the moment he starts dialysis. And so even though he hasn't showed up at kidney transplant clinic, once he gets listed, and let's say it takes three months for him to get listed, he'll get those three years plus those three months on his on his time that's already accrued. And so in Michigan, we're looking at about five years for a kidney transplant. I know it's longer in New York. What are you guys looking for in New York? Right um, so the number that we quote is eight to 10 years. Oh, Ooh. just heartbreaking. Wow. That is awful. So for, for a group A, uh, our waiting list is like two and a half years. For B, of course, it goes up to about five years. Yeah, so the next question I get after a patient asks me that is, well, where can I go for a shorter wait time? And my answer is any other region. It will be shorter. Or (laughs) Ottawa, apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Kind of along these lines, I think a statistic that is always very jarring to me every time I see it is a percentage of dialysis patients that are on kidney transplant wait lists, and it's around like 15%. Um, and has not really changed over the last several years. Um, so just another kind of reason to get these patients um, into our offices early. Samira, can you, so 15% of dialysis patients are on the transplant wait list? Uh, that was, I just looked at the USRDS data today before we got on the call, and that was what I saw. And what is the estimate number that could be listed if, you understand what I'm saying? Like, what, what's, it's not, right, right, not right. everybody could be listed, right? Right, right. Um, that's a great question. Um, I have not seen that reported anywhere, but... Um, I probably, you know, I would say maybe closer to 40, 50%. Yeah, I was going to guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, I remember when I was a fellow or even before, you know, we would be very picky about, uh, whom to list. It would be like, we look at a dialysis patient and say, oh, you're young and, and you look good. You don't have, you know, no history of heart disease, no this, no that. You should definitely get a transplant. And, and there was a lot of selection going on then. And it became loser and loser, and our criteria have gone increasing over the years. We actually, and I think many other centers have done that, what we we nudge people the other way is that rather than say, do you think this patient is a candidate? We ask people to specify, is this patient not a candidate? And why not? Right. Uh, and that has sort of reversed uh, the, the way of thinking. So you have to give a reason to say, why is this patient not a candidate? And, and that actually increased. So uh, the 10 years ago or so, when we did a transplant in someone who was more than 80 years, um, and uh, you know everyone was asking us, are you guys crazy? And, and since then, I think we have done more than 10 transplants who are more than 80. And, and that oh goes God. back to, right, you know, why, why should you do a transplant compared to staying, keeping them on dialysis? Yeah. Uh, so so we, we do know that the outcomes, you know, even with a preemptive transplant, we do know that the outcomes with transplant are better than staying on dialysis. But... It doesn't start, the, the increase in life expectancy is not on day one, right? There is that uh, study right. which shows that it crosses over. So initially, there is a higher risk uh, with the surgery, with the post-transplant immunosuppression of bad things happening. And, and, and depending on how high risk the person is, uh, you know, that uh, the life expectancy actually increases compared to dialysis after, what, one and a half years or so? Yeah. And that and may be yeah, different based on... It kind yeah. of tracks similarly to when you start to see the um, economic financial benefit, which is after the one-year mark, um, mm-hmm. because of all the upfront costs of the surgery and that initial admission. Right, right. So people are thinking about, hey, you have an 80-year-old person and you're talking about transplanting them. They are not going to do well, but but they are not going to do well, perhaps compared to the 60-year-old person who has a transplant. But they are definitely going to do, I mean, they're very likely to do better compared to the 80-year-old patient who stays on dialysis. Right, so that's the correct comparison. It's not comparing the older patient to the younger patient or the, you know, someone with more co- comorbidities to the one with less comorbidities. But the fact that dialysis sucks so much that uh, right. transplant is better. Yeah, and it's not it's not just the number of months that these patients gain with a transplant is that they have a better life. Their quality of life goes way up. They're not going to dialysis. They don't have the dietary restrictions. They're they're happier. They have more uh, they have more life in their life. They're like the happiest patient patients we see in the hospital when we're uh, at least during fellowship. They were actually really glad to be there, and and then just seeing their reaction when they see the urine flowing to their Foley post op. 
is something. Yeah, like. I, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, go, one of the best, one of the most enjoyable things in the post-op, you know, period is to go there and watch the urine come out. <laughs> urine makes nephrologists happy. Well, I wish you would all join us in the transplant nephrology workforce <laughs> <laughs> since it's so great. <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, I guess urine for you guys is like when we're bronking and we're sucking out those huge goobers in the bronx suite. It's it's just as rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this guy that we invited? Oh, that, is, that is success, my friend. Well, let's success. talk about all the work that goes um, into producing our urine, all the all the manipulation and uh, transporters. Yeah, you might you may have me beat there. Um, I do. Um, I did want to ask another question, um, uh, kind of a patient centered question. So I imagine there's quite a bit of counseling that goes into play when you're beginning this discussion of transplant. Unfortunately, in Mr. Um, Wilson's case, um, it happened um, you know, perhaps a little bit later, quite a bit later than it should have. Um, but suppose you have a patient, um, you know, you caught him at the right time and you're counseling them. What kinds of things do you do you discuss with them uh, specifically in terms of you know, maybe mortality benefit? which we touched on a little bit. Um, and then, um, you know, also if they say, oh, you know, I have a brother or something, you know, that, that wants to donate, um, can I bring them along? You know, how do you how do you have those discussions? Yeah, so I would say that probably the first 10 to 20 minutes of every kidney transplant initial evaluation visit I do is really just talking about often the severity of their kidney disease and why are they in my office. Um, because often they're not really sure why they're there. They know that their kidney doctor maybe referred them and they were told that at some point they may need a kidney transplant. And oftentimes they have not even really prepared mentally for the possibility of dialysis. So once we've kind of spoken about that, that kidney disease is irreversible, then we, then we begin the conversation of what is the kidney transplant? How does it work? It is, it's a surgery that they're going to have. These are the different options. And so we kind of start the conversation there. And then oftentimes for most patients, it's the first time they're hearing about the differences between a deceased donor kidney transplant versus a living donor kidney transplant. You will take medications afterwards to um, protect that kidney because often what they think is that once they have the transplant, all their existing medications will kind of melt away. And so we try to prepare them just from that very first visit that is actually probably the opposite, especially in the first three to six month period, their medicines may double or even triple depending on kind of what their underlying uh, medical problems are. And if that appropriate counseling is not done, it can be very challenging post-transplant um, to kind of give them this new medication list and there, um, it can be, you know, um, difficult for them to handle. Um, so we try to start there from the very first visit, and we encourage all of our um, initial evaluations to, when that appointment is even made, we counsel them to bring somebody with them, because it is a lot of information, and it is hard for one person to kind of take it in. And we also like to start that conversation about living donation early on. And we know that for the majority of our patients, asking someone to be a living donor is a very, very difficult conversation. And so usually what will happen is if you ask a patient, do you have any living donors? The answer will be no. And if you don't probe it a little bit further, you will probably not uncover that they've actually never asked anyone because they have not been ready to talk about their disease, or there are many reasons why you may not want to ask someone to give up an organ. So having another person there with them, family member, friend, who kind of understands the severity, we remind them, you know, that kidney transplant patients do better in the long term, um, that can kind of help move things along. Um, and often we'll see these patients back after a few months if they've been struggling getting their evaluation testing done to check in, see how they're doing, try to help them with some of their scheduling visits. Um, and if they've completed the evaluation, if they're going to be on our wait list, and then we try to see them back in our clinic annually um, to see if anything has changed, if any of their testing needs to be updated, um, things like that. One of the other things that I think patients don't grasp is it's not just relatives that can donate. It's really, it's any healthy person that's willing to donate. Uh, the, 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 abil the transplant uh, nephrologists have just done a wonderful job being able to cross uh, these immunologic barriers. And as long as there's not blood type problems, and even that is crossable now, uh, we can get that transplant done. And there's, a, and there's a lot of tricks in terms of paired donation, a lot of ways to uh, really, if you have a person who's willing to donate, that can result in you getting the kidney, even if it's not their kidney going in you. Um, but uh, mm. it's like a three-way deal in the NFL or something. Or like, yeah, or, yeah, or it's, it's called um, it's called the um, National Kidney Registry Swap Program. And so, oftentimes, there are kidney chains that are like you know 
10, 20 patients long where you just have like chains of, of donors going into someone else who is not the person that actually brought them into the system. And, um, you know, when you draw it out on paper, it looks very elegant. Um, but when you actually talk to patients about it and they're uh, donating family members or friends, it, it does take some explaining to do that. This is a process that we trust because the first question always comes up is, well, what if I give my kidney to someone else and then my family member never gets one? So it takes a lot of kind of reassuring and explaining um, and to not rule out those um, eligible and willing living donors just because of a, a blood type um, mismatch. So maybe moving on so we can suppose that um, our patient's now gotten a transplant, was fortunate enough to get a transplant, um, and now we're kind of in the, the early stages of that. Maybe I'll start by asking if you can maybe tell us some of the common medications or classes of medications that are used um, in these transplant patients, um, how they're chosen, um, and, and you know maybe the ramifications of some of those decisions for patients that are uh, looking at transplant or have recently gotten a transplant. And so many of the issues that transplant patients face, not specifically kidney transplant, are directly related to the medication. So either adverse effects from them, increased risk of infection, um, and some of the medications have more specific effects that we can talk about individually. Um, but the main medications are going to be the immunosuppressants. And so in general, um, every patient will be on two or three medications, um, and every transplant center has their own protocol of what they uh, recommend for patients that are transplanted at their center. And that standard regimen may change over time based on how the patient does. So um, if they have medication intolerance or specific adverse effects, they may be switched to different classes, different drugs within the classes. Um, but in general, almost everyone is on what we call a calcineurin inhibitor. So that's uh, would be immunosuppressant number one. And those two flavors are tacrolimus um, or Prograf, which is the, the trade name, or cyclosporin. Um, so in general, uh, most centers would be using tecrolimus as their uh, first-line therapy. So if you see someone on cyclosporin, then they may have not tolerated tecrolimus for um, some reason or another. Um, the second medication would be what we call the anti-metabolite, and so that interferes with the um, DNA replication within the, the um, immune cells. And so um, in the 60s when transplant was first starting, that was azathioprine, and that has been more recently um, replaced with um, mycophenolic acid. And so the preparation that we use more commonly is myco, um, mycophenolate mofetil, um, but some patients may also be on mycophenolate sodium. And so the trade names for that are Celsept and Myfortic. Um, and then the third medication, which um, patients increasingly may not be on because of changing protocols, would be the corticosteroid. Um, so the standard dose um, kind of long term would be five milligrams of prednisone and then maybe at a higher dose in the peritransplant period. So um, each of those medications has their own um, adverse effect profiles, drug-drug interactions. Um, and so what I think is most important for the internist is to be mindful that those medications are lifelong medications and that any medication may have some potential to interact. And so what we suggest is that before starting any new medication, just to check in with the transplant nephrologist or pharmacist to see how that new medication may impact these other immunosuppressants, whether it's the trough levels or um, some medications may actually um, exaggerate um, adverse effect profile. As an internist, you know, I'm thinking of some of the common medications we use for diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Um, are there certain kind of classic interactions that we should be on the lookout for? Um, anything that comes to mind? Um, so I guess the kind of good news is that most of the kidney transplant patients or patients with kidney transplant also have diabetes, hypertension, and are on cholesterol-lowering medication. So the majority of them are, in general, safe. Um, so I'll just go by each class um, and uh, tell you kind of what we look out for most commonly. So with the calcineurin inhibitors, um, they're metabolized by one of the uh, P450 um, cytochrome isoforms, uh, mainly CYP3A. So what we really look out for are any medications that may interfere with that metabolism pathway. And so specifically, if medications are potent inducers or inhibitors of that isoform, then we um, would need to not necessarily not use that medication, but we would need to monitor the calcineurin inhibitors and to uh, make sure that with the new drug, we are at a therapeutic uh, target level. And so some examples of inducers or 
medications that would decrease calcineurin levels and potentially increase the risk of rejection would be carbamazepine, um, phenobarbital, phenytoin, and rifampin is, is a common one um, that can really lower the CNI levels. Um, on the flip side, drugs that can really kind of increase the levels dramatically are diltiazem, verapamil, um, erythromycin, or any of the macrolides, um, fluconazole, which is commonly used, um, or protease um, inhibitors that are used as parts of antiretroviral therapy, such as ritonavir, those can really um, significantly impact the calcineurin trough levels. There's also some other, um, um, you know, like grape, grapefruit juice mm-hmm. or uh, and stuff like that that patients need to be aware of, right? Uh, yeah, so gra- I forget now. Right, so grapefruit juice is a... Um, I believe it's an inducer. It's an inducer. Yeah, so it's yeah. an inducer and St. John's wort is an inhibitor. Yes. Um, Can I give my uh, thirty-second exam for the general, general, general nephrologist for a transplant patient? Yes, please. Okay, here we go, um, Cyrus. Me and you here. Okay. Okay. We're talking. All right. Whew, okay, so first it. off, um, it's hair growth in places you don't want it, and you lose it in places you do. Ask them that. Put their hands out to see if they have a tremor. Stick your tongue out. See if you have uh, any thrush, and then ask if they have diarrhea, and then you're done. Take a look at the gums. If they're on cyclosporin, they can get the gums, yeah. gingival hyperplasia. A little bit edema, blood pressure, and then they get that prograph level in a few days. So those are the those are the big ones you need to look for. See if they're over immunosuppressed with the thrush. You see what their tacrolimus or cyclosporin level is with the with their trimmer, and then to see what their MMF level is, you ask them, you know, if they have diarrhea or not. That can also get get uh, CMV as well. And then the the other part of the physical exam is look at their skin. These patients have a very high rate of um, uh, skin cancer, and so take the time to have them take off their shirt, go through, look over look over their skin completely. So I'm going to go back to the first uh, question that Matt asked about the hair, and so um, hair growth or hair loss. So. Um, Alopecia or hirsutism are um, common side effects that are seen with tacrolimus and cyclosporin. Um, we don't really understand the mechanism that well, but tacrolimus is associated with alopecia. And so oftentimes, if patients are experiencing that, we may switch them to cyclosporin, and then they'll get the be able to take advantage of the hirsutism, though usually that is hair growth in unwanted places like the face. Um, so that's a very common reason to switch within the drug class from one to the other. Here's another question since Matt brought up diarrhea. Um, What should an internist do if a transplant patient calls in with um, food poisoning or acute diarrhea that's pretty severe from a viral illness? Uh, so the approach to diarrhea, uh, the number one thing that we would look for is, as you men- mentioned, food poisoning would be an infectious etiology. And so with anyone that's having diarrhea that's persistent for more than a few days, first thing would be to, to do a GI stool pathogen panel to look for any organisms that might be there. Um, if that comes up negative, and of course C. diff would be included in that for patients with kidney transplant and immunosuppressed. Um, after that, as Matt mentioned, we think about um, CMV colitis, um, which is a pretty common cause of diarrhea. CMV infection can really present in any way, um, but diarrhea is probably talked about the most. Um, and then after that, we always think about um, the effect of, of um, cell scepter mycophenolic acid. Um, and this can really happen at any point. A patient can be on um, cell sub for several years, not have diarrhea, suddenly show up with diarrhea, and it could potentially be related to the drug. Um, the mechanism of action, um, not 100% clear, but there is a pretty um, characteristic finding that is, is described by the pathologist. If we do a colonoscopy, they will say this looks like MMF-associated colitis. There's some injury, um, t- some inflammatory injury that's there. Um, there may be some overlap in how that looks with IBD. Um, but generally, the MMF-related diarrhea is going to be a clinical diagnosis. And um, sometimes we'll switch them to the other drug in the class, which is myfortic or mycophenolate sodium. Um, or you can try lowering the drug. Um, there are really no um, randomized studies to show that one drug causes more or less diarrhea than the other, um, but uh, many of my, my more senior partners have a lot of anecdotal evidence that it works, and so that's usually kind of our go-to. Um, and some patients may just chronically be on lower levels of, of cell set because of the GI intolerance, and it's not just diarrhea. They can also have nausea, vomiting, and so, um, you know, we... 
you have to um, prioritize kind of patient symptoms, though they likely are going to now be at a higher risk of uh, rejection. On, on the diarrhea angle, um, I also have heard that tacrolimus can sometimes cause diarrhea, uh, though, though less common than, of course, than uh, uh, mycophenolate. Yeah, and that maybe diarrhea increases tacrolimus levels. It's yeah, kind of so, a- so the the mechanism for that is actually really interesting. So if you have, say, for example, you have an infectious colitis, you get damage to your um, enterocytes. There's actually p glycoprotein, which is responsible for tacrolimus efflux, or or you know contributing to the excretion of the drug. So if you damage those, that p glycoprotein is is um, not going to function appropriately. So it can significantly increase your um, serum levels, and we see that regularly in patients that come in with um, inflammatory diarrhea. On the flip side, very high um, calcineurin levels that are kind of in the toxic range, uh, maybe over 20, 30, those can cause a, a diarrhea picture as well. And then lastly, um, these patients are very susceptible to volume depletion and acute kidney injury. And so uh, if you have a patient with diarrhea, it's worth checking a creatinine. And the other thing to consider in addition to drug toxicity and food poisoning is uh, opportunistic infection with a CMV or other of other organism uh, causing that uh, diarrhea. And so it's just, it, you, you just, you need to kind of change your natural reflexes with these patients. They are different. Your differential needs to be a little bit broader and you need to be a little bit more sensitive uh, to that uh, that organ that can be a little bit more delicate than we're used to. Yeah, we have a very, very low threshold with them, um, even, you know, something like diarrhea to send to bring them in for um, further evaluation, often low threshold to even send our patients to the emergency department. Um, and part of the reason that I, I actually went into transplant nephrology was because I love internal medicine. And when a transplant patient has diarrhea, it can literally be anything. And so your differential, nothing is going to be wrong. Anything is possible from infection to drug effects to malignancy. Um, it's really kind of all there. Um, and so that's why we don't really hesitate to begin a more thorough investigation. Uh, before we move on, one thing I definitely want to um, talk about specifically, because uh, I've been faced with this before, is um, in terms of actual drug levels, um, is there any sort of guidance in terms of um, what are our goals? What should we be checking? How often should we be checking it? The reality is a lot of times, um, you know, internists are uh, ordering these tests or reviewing these tests. I think it's important for, for us to kind of know what to look yeah, absolutely. for. Absolutely. Um, so of the three um, immunosuppressants that I mentioned, the only one that we um, clinically follow trough levels are the calcineurin inhibitors. And so the trough um, is most accurate when it's taken 30 minutes prior to the dose. So, for example, if a patient takes medicines at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., and we try to encourage them to be as close to that 12-hour mark as they can, um, if they come into the clinic, we would try to draw the blood work as close to 8.30 as we could. Um, What happens in practice is that our patients come in for morning clinic visits. We tell them to hold their morning dose, and then we'll draw the blood work, and then they'll take the medication in the clinic. Um, so, uh, target levels. Um, so after the, you know, six to 12 month period, um, the kind of standard calcineurin inhibitor, um, or tacrolimus level that we shoot for is, um, everyone's going to say something a little bit different, but I'll say for this five to seven is probably a, an acceptable trough. Um, but again, I want to emphasize that a patient, um, targets may change over the life of their transplant depending on what may happen to them. So for example, if there's someone that has a malignancy, you may have lower trough levels. If there's someone that is prone to rejection, they've had multiple episodes of rejection, you may run them at a higher um, calcineurin level. Um, for cyclosporin, the chronic trough levels are probably going to be around between 100 and 150. Um, some may run a little bit higher or lower than that. Um, and again, a lot of this is based on um, each center may have a slightly different practice, um, but in general, um, the targets are are pretty close. And if I can add some of my pet peeves is, uh, you know, these are pharmacokinetic monitoring. We are monitoring drug levels. Really, what you want to do is pharmacodynamic, right? When I give a blood pressure drug, I don't measure the level of amlodipine. I measure their blood pressure. Um, so what you really want to know is, you know, is there a immune system measurement? Uh, but we don't have that. Uh, so this is this is very, very crude, uh, even despite all the fine tuning we have done um, for for uh, and for other drugs like uh, mycophenolate, for example, it has it's hard to do that. Right. So we, we discussed it on, on a journal club a few months ago. 
um, and ideally what you want to have is an area under the curve and and to do an area under the curve you need i don't know four five six mm-hmm. ten measurements which makes it very very hard um, so we just don't measure it mostly <laughs> because it's hard yeah so i think in an ideal world we Swapnel, as you said, we would want this kind of level of immune activity test, um, but we don't obviously don't have that. And so a lot of what we do um, in our practice is unfortunately a bit reactive. Um, so we put patients on our standard protocol. Within six months, they have an acute rejection. Okay, we, we got it wrong. It's too low. Um, within six months, they come in with you know CMV viremia. Okay, we got it wrong. We need to lower it. And so the, that's why the close follow-up is so important because things can really change significantly over the lifetime um, of the allograft. And it is it's much more than the science. It's kind of the art of immunosuppression, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's really important for a transplant nephrologist to do it rather than, you know, someone like me following some, you know, numbers. My, my scientific approach to long-term transplant care after, you know, say five, six years is the level is good for two reasons. One, are they taking the med? And two, is it toxic? And something that we also do often is uh, most of our patients, we encourage them to get labs every month or every two months we can kind of see how the how the trough levels fluctuate over time. And so if they're not kind of consistently within the target and we have not made any changes, that kind of suggests to us there may be some challenges with adherence. Yeah, and, and that, could that be some, you know, white coat adherence, uh, you know, so patients white know. White coat when they... adherence. Yeah, blood absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, we talk about that in blood pressure. Like but, brush you know? your teeth right before you see the dentist. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. You floss your teeth before you see the dentist. Yeah, exactly. floss, yeah. Yeah, 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 floss. Yeah. I do brush every yeah. day. So, so, you know, there are these... Floss uh, right before the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do want to talk about some specific post-transplant complications and, and, and give that some time. In addition to the immunosuppressant agents, um, if we need to be thinking about prophylaxis, uh, prophylactic type medications for any particular conditions, you know, PCP prophylaxis, um, osteoporosis, uh, prophylaxis, those are things I'm always thinking about. Mm -hmm. What about for the kidney transplant patient? Um, Yeah, so uh, prophylaxis uh, medications, again, each center may have a slightly different regimen. um, But in general, I think the standard approach is in the post-transplant period for at least three months, almost all patients um, would be on um, CMV prophylaxis. And this, the dose um, and duration is dictated by what we call their CMV risk. And so the highest risk patient would be a recipient who is CMV naive or a CMV IgG negative who gets a, an organ from a donor who is CMV IgG positive. So that would be kind of the highest risk of transmission. Um, the lowest risk um, would be a negative to a negative, And then the other combinations would kind of be a moderate risk. Um, and so um, we would continue that prophylaxis for a three to six month period, depending on the risk profile. And then after that, we have a protocol for screening for CMV until we kind of get to the one year period. Um, so that's one. Um, at our center, we do three month prophylaxis for um, for thrush with um, nystatin. Um, and there's actually no data for that in um, kidney transplant, um, like there is in other organs um, where there is bowel anastomosis, for example, on pancreas. Um, but we do have that as part of our protocol. So that's nice that in swish and swallow for three months. Um, and um, for pneumocystis and no cardia prophylaxis, um, our center now recommends lifelong Bactrim. And that is with or without um, corticosteroid. Right. Um, we, we, we were had, not doing Bactrim before and, and we had a, a, yeah, a bunch of cases a few years ago and we have changed that to have mm-hmm. cotrimoxazole uh, again. Yeah, and kind of... Um, trivia but important pearl um, for 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 Bactrim is that many patients um, are switched from Bactrim to another pneumocystis prophylactic agent um, because of um, hyperkalemia or thrombocytopenia. Um, and um, if you have to keep in mind that if you do switch them, you lose that prophylaxis against nocardia. And we have had cases of disseminated nocardia infection um, in patients in which Bactrim was discontinued. So um, we, we try hard. Um, there obviously are several issues with Bactrim, and it's not a, you know, a drug that without problems. Um, but we kind of have a, had a recent push in the last year to really try to keep our patients on Bactrim. Great. That's really helpful to, to know because I, I, I know, you know, I'm hearing you say that um, oftentimes steroids are spared, uh, you know, and we always, you know, of course, we always try to, st- st- to spare steroids, but I always think of PCP prophylaxis, Bactrim, steroids as being kind of like this, um, this thought model, mm-hmm. but it sounds like that's not necessarily the case mm-hmm. here. We're worried about other 
you know. Yeah, and it's, you know, drugs. sometimes we can get creative with the dosing. Um, if patients have um, can't tolerate the drug for whatever reason, um, we have patients that do three times a week dosing. We have patients that do two times a week dosing. Um, really, kind of whatever they can tolerate. With steroids, uh, does anyone do uh, vitamin D or calcium or anything like that? Um, so we have um, vitamin D and calcium on the protocol. I think over time, um, the calcium may get dropped off if the calcium lo- calcium levels are okay and keep the vitamin D. Um, but the more recent data looking at bone health does really shows that with these kind of lower levels of steroids, like in the five milligram range, um, the risk of um, bone disease is not necessarily higher in this population. So I think in the time that we have left, I'd really love to talk about some of the um, kind of um, more classic post-transplant complications. Um, the reason being is that I could see as a hospitalist, you know, taking care of some of these patients post-operatively in conjunction with uh, the, the nephrology team, the surgical team. I think it's important for us to recognize, um, you know, some of the um, uh, some of the symptoms we may see. Um, in the, in the perioperative period or postoperative period. So I guess um, a good way to open this up would just be um, uh, maybe more with pathophysiology in terms of graft rejection. You know, what's actually going on with those folks? Um, you know, what do we need to know in terms of the pathophys behind the graft rejection? Um, so allograft rejection is a um, kind of very Im- immunologically complicated area. So I'll try to... Um summarize the best I can. Um, So if we kind of separate rejection to two major groups, one would be cellular rejection or more T-cell mediated. And then this other type would be antibody mediated mediated rejection or more B-cell. More recently, um, in the last five to 10 years, there has been appreciation that both T and B-cells are likely implicated in both. Um, But for diagnostic and treatment purposes, we do categorize them as one or the other, and that really does dictate um, kind of what we do for treatment. Um, So the T-cell, I'll just describe how it looks in pathology because I think that's the best way to understand what's going on. Um, When we look at the kidney biopsy, we're looking for infiltration of inflammatory cells in the interstitial space of the kidney um, and within the tubules. And so we make the diagnosis pathologically by having a significant portion of the interstitium affected by these inflammatory cells, and we have a threshold for how many inflammatory cells we need to see within the within the tubular wall. And so if we see meet that criteria, then we can essentially make a diagnosis of acute cellular rejection. Um, in more severe cases, the arteries actually may be infected. That's something that we call arteritis, and that represents kind of the most severe form of um, acute cellular rejection. On the antibody side, what we see pathologically is a little bit different, and this is thought to be due to antibody-mediated injury that is both complement-dependent and also complement-independent effects. So what we may see on biopsy can range from acute tubular necrosis to thrombotic microangiopathy or TMA. Um, We also look for evidence of complement deposition. Specifically, we look for the classical pathway component called C4D, and we look for deposition of that within the vasculature of the kidney. So if we have those findings in conjunction with the presence of Um, an antibody. And so most commonly, this will be a donor-specific antibody. So an antibody that we can detect um, kind of indirectly in the recipient that is against the donor's um, HLA um, alleles. There can also be antibodies that the recipient may have against the allograft that are not HLA-specific, but the general idea is that there is an antibody attacking the allograft and causing injury. And so depending on the type of rejection we have, that kind of dictates our treatment regimen. Um, If someone has antibody-mediated rejection, um, treatment approaches would be um, to increase immunosuppression with steroids, to try to remove that antibody with plasmapheresis, to try to maybe bind and immunomodulate the system a bit with intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG. And then for acute cellular rejection, the approach would be, because this is mainly T-cell-mediated, to really try to decrease that T-cell activity. So one way to do that is to try to deplete the T-cells using something called anti-thymocyte globulin, which is basically kind of like a nuclear bomb that gets rid of um, most of your T-cells, um, and then also increasing the steroids, calcineurin inhibitor, and that anti-metabolite. And so I think that's that's kind of, I think, the best way to think about the two main types of rejection. Can I throw some geography into that immunology lesson? Yeah, please. Uh, it, so, nothing about Canada, please. 
Come on! Aren't they known as the BAMF criteria? Oh, uh, I just killed that. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 I, and a small confession: I did not know BAMF was a place until I came to Canada. <laughs> I had, you know, learned the BAMF criteria and I knew everything about the BAMF criteria, but I did not know it was a place. BAMF beautiful. is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. So, everyone should do a Google image search for BAMF. Uh, and if uh, on the tone of confessing, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers the Ann Arbor criteria for Hodgkin's lymphoma. <laughs> Jo laughs. They, they, does anyone know that they used to be something like that? So, uh, growing up in Mumbai, I thought Ann Arbor was a person. <laughs> 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 I thought she was a famous, you know, pathologist or something. Ann Arbor. <laughs> well, one thing we we need to point out here is that a lot these patients have a lot of cardiovascular disease, and that's one thing you need to be on the lookout for. And what is it? Forty percent of patients die with a functioning graft. And so uh, you have to really be, you know, thinking about cardiovascular causes of uh, complications. But it's not necessary. It's because it's such a good therapy that um, that the actual kidney outlives the person many times. Right, right. The yeah, number the, one the, cause of uh, graft failure is not really graft failure. It is death with a functioning graft. Uh, we have got so much so better at treating rejection and preventing rejection that. It doesn't happen so often, uh, you know. After the acute, I guess the well, first year when we kidneys an eighty year old, it's inevitable. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to go, go back to the BAMF criteria for a second, as Swapnil I think was starting to mention. Um, so the BAMF criteria are the official pathologic criteria that allow us to make. Uh, the diagnosis of rejection and how severe it is. Um, so there are obviously limitations with that, sampling bias, um, and something we can talk about in the Nef Madness teams. Um, but um, we also know that if we take the same biopsy slide, have it read by two different pathologists, there's a high likelihood that we'll, we may get a different diagnosis. But, uh, I think it's super helpful to, to have a better idea as to kind of what's going on at the kind of cellular uh, molecular level. I wonder um, clinically in terms of what we might see, um, what are the harbingers of rejection? What should we be on the lookout for when we're going through our daily labs as a hospitalist or we're evaluating the patient at the bedside? So um, the a rise in creatinine is probably the best way for us to find rejection. However, we also are sensitive to increases in proteinuria, new appearance of hematuria. And so every month in all of our patients, we get basic metabolic panels along with your analysis. And so any small changes, um, almost all transplant nephrologists, myself included, very low threshold to biopsy the allograft. And so patients may have many uh, biopsies in the lifetime of their kidney transplant. Um, and um, oftentimes that may not show rejection, um, but we, are, we do aggressively look for that because we do have uh, treatment for that. Yeah, in some centers so I, actually, I, sorry, in some centers actually do what is called as a protocol biopsy is that whether the patient has a rejection or not, they just biopsy the kidney uh, to find out what's going on and, and treat it before the, you know, creatinine rises. It's it's a very insensitive way of looking at things, yeah, right? The, there's nothing, there's something very illuminating when you get a, a protocol biopsy and the kidney function is stone cold normal and they're finding rejection and you're like, oh my gosh, this, the, what we routinely depend on the serum creatinine is just not a great test. Yeah, I think um, one area where, where transplants um, differ a bit in the management from native kidney disease is that we're, I think, a little bit more sensitive to even small fluctuations in the creatinine. Um, if you have a patient with chronic kidney disease that may be progressing at the rate that you feel like is acceptable, you may kind of sit tight. Um, in a patient with a kidney transplant, we might be a little bit quicker to, to do something a little bit more invasive, even if, if it's just to show that this is kind of normal wear and tear um, because we may find another entity called borderline rejection, which is not does not meet the criteria, but may suggest to us that there may be some degree of under immunosuppression. And so I would say um, a high percentage of the time, the biopsy that we do lead to some change in management, even if it may be um, subtle. Uh, and we may also sometimes see evidence of, you know, tacrolimus toxicity, uh, or what is CNI toxicity, or, or you may get some, you know, completely unrelated finding or uh, whatchamacallit, is it still called BK virus or, or polyoma? Mm -hmm. or, or uh, yeah, so so BK nephropathy is another big problem that is a sign of over-immunosuppression. Um, and it is a, 
um, infection that does not present in any other way other than with potentially an acute kidney injury um, and infiltration of the um, of the kidney. Um, and so the way that we find that is that we check um, BK virus levels in the blood. So in the first year for year post transplant, we do that um, monthly, and then going forward, um, my practice is to check that every year. Um, and so sometimes the first sign of that may be detectable viral level. And so that is, again, a sign that you have maybe over immunosuppressed this person. Maybe it's time to decrease um, one of the medications to let that virus clear. I think that's a, it's, I appreciate that, um, those insights because I think it's really important to, to have an idea as to what to be looking for clinically so as to inform the decisions that you guys make in terms of, oh, well, we're going to go ahead and pull the trigger on, uh, on a biopsy or something like that. And then also, you know, again, I think being vigilant for um, – immunosuppressant related complications, um, is also something that, um, I think, you know, can't be, uh, can't be overstated. Um, now I know that, um, I think, um, Matt had mentioned, um, cardiovascular death, uh, or cardiovascular complications in relation to kidney transplant. I think that, um, as well as kind of, uh, increased risk for certain malignancies, those are two areas I did want to touch on. So, um, could we, uh, maybe delve a little bit deeper into those two, two topics? Sure. Um, so the, the cardiovascular risk, um, so many of our patients, um, have, have obviously have chronic kidney disease, which is a strong cardiovascular risk factor. Many of them have been on dialysis for several years. Unfortunately, the kidney transplant cannot reverse, um, that disease that has already, um, already progressed. Um, so that is still remains a significant cardiovascular risk factor. I think something that is new post-transplant are the calcineurin inhibitors, um, which have kind of a long um, side effect profile. Um, but hypertension, dyslipidemias, worsening of diabetes, those are three things that I think significantly contribute to, gar- to cardiovascular risk in these patients. On top of that, by 10 years, all patients with kidney transplant will have evidence of nephrotoxicity on their kidney biopsy. So patients with transplants will also develop CKD. And so again, adding another cardiovascular risk factor. Um, and then depending on how well the diabetes may or may not be controlled, how their blood pressure is doing, I think the risk factors that are there before can potentially be exacerbated um, or at least are still present um, post-transplant. The thing to remember, though, is the people that get a transplant, they have to go through cardiac clearance, and at least at our institutions. And we know how good that is. Well, but but our institutions, it's very aggressive that they that uh, our transplant team really is not satisfied with uh, a stress test. They really want almost everybody to get cath, and then after that, they're very aggressive about requesting revascularization. Yeah, and isn't that isn't that very con- controversial? Because uh, there's a movement. Um, to push against that because, you know, again, going back to, uh, yes, I have had a, actually, I've had a transplant patient who had a MI, uh, post transplant, which is awful. You're that's, not doing that's what your argument very, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's what, service. that's what they're trying to avoid. But, <laughs> okay. but, uh, but on the flip side, you know, there are how many patients don't even get to transplant and they remain stuck on dialysis because, you know, Hey, you do a cardiac cath. I can't imagine any dialysis patient who has a cardiac cath, which comes out with clean coronaries, right? So you are going to find something and then the temptation to fix it is going to be high. And, and many of them will have a disease that is not amenable to a PCI. So you're talking about doing cabbages right, left and center. So, and, so talk and about we, what, we what's the go, morbidity go of a CABG. PCI does anything story. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah. We're, we, we're not going to go into the whole, does a PCI actually help someone with stable Exactly, CAD. exactly. And, and so, so I think it, uh, there's a British group that has actually pushed back and they're talking about you know, let's look at the trade-off. It's like, hey, transplant is, even if they have cardiovascular disease, a transplant is going to give them better quality of life. Well, here's uh, a good Death Madness dialysis. mashup right here. How yeah. about we take this, and now we got SGLT2 inhibitors for transplant. And, and, and what that might do is not just help their kidney, but help their cardiovascular help. So that'd be a huge win if that would work. And give them a lot of UTIs and fungal infection. Oh, come on, Swap. You're always so negative. <laughs> so I, I want to say, so far, that, and, you know, 
um, everyone can take a look at the Neff Madness um, write up on this. Um, but there are several case reports, case series of using SGL2 inhibitors in patients with kidney transplant that have not really shown a significantly um, concerning signal for um, UTI. Take that swap. <laughs> um, and kind of along those lines of kind of using medications to help with this cardiovascular risk factor, um, there are many reasons why the, the transplant community wants to get away from these calcineurin inhibitors. And it really kind of revolves around this adverse effect profile, the nephrotoxicity, the cardiovascular risk. Um, there are several electrolyte derangements um, that may occur. And so we are trying to learn more about um, the newer immunosuppressant that we did mention, Belatacept, um, which is a co blockade agent um, that we are using in our center now to, um, if we have patients with um, significant calcineurin inhibitor nephrotoxicity, um, to switch them to belatacept, get them off of that calcineurin inhibitor. Um, and we have seen some improvements um, and have seen that patients can safely tolerate that without um, overt increased risk of um, rejection. Um, but the one um, important difference about belatacept is it's not a pill, it's a once a month infusion. Um, so that may or may not be beneficial for um, all patients. Uh, what about uh, statins? Do, do, trans- do, do we believe statins work in, uh, in the transplant setting? Um, so the, the data is um, not you know, super strong, um, but I will say that the KDGO guideline is to start all kidney transplant patients on a statin if they are not on one already. And I find that kind of paradoxical, right? Because in, in when someone doesn't have CKD, we say statins are fantastic. And uh, on dialysis, the evidence is kind of iffy. But after they get a transplant, they get a statin again. You know, right. So uh, arguably, just leave yeah. them on throughout. Even yeah. if they and get again, n- you know, not to harp on calcineurin inhibitor effects, but cyclosporin kind of directly um, dysregulates the, the lipid pathways and can lead to pretty significant dyslipidemias. Uh, and so, so sorry, uh, on, on malignancies, did we talk about malignancies? Uh, That's what I was going to ask was specifically as the malignancies, what should we be on the lookout for and how does our screening change in these folks? Yeah, so um, I think the easiest screening to talk about first is um, dermatologic. Um, so our patients that are significantly increased risk for all kinds of skin cancers. Um, so when I see my patients for their routine follow-up visits, one of the things on my checklist is annual visit with a dermatologist. Um, if they have not had any skin cancers, if they have had them, then the um, visits to the dermatologist would be a little bit more regular. Um, and the second one that I think is a little bit more particular to transplant patients, though there's no really data or strict guidelines on this, is um, colon cancer screening. Um, so prior to transplant, we do every 10 years if we're doing the colonoscopy. Um, there's increasing um, movement um, uh, particularly at uh, what I've noticed in our institution is to move towards maybe every five-year screening, um, not because of any um, uh, evidence of polyps or anything, but just because they're on these immunosuppressants. Um, so a little bit of a potentially higher threshold. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure where the um, gastroenterologist kind of feel about this, but we do have some patients that get screening every five years um, just because they're on immunosuppressants. Um, and the other big cancer that um, is always kind of in the back of our mind and is always on the differential, um, especially with an ambiguous presentation, is post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, um, PTLD, which can really present in any organ. Um, we talk about it more in the um, central nervous system, but it can really pop up anywhere. And, and PTLD is nasty. It's really, really nasty. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, my, my, the cases that I've seen have all done horribly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't had a single good outcome with PTLD. It's, but we have yeah. to all recognize how amazing a kidney transplant is. There's a lot of complications. Many of them are very rare. But overall, it's just an amazing thing. And I think for nephrology, um, we're pitching that for someone wanting to go into the field. There's so many different options. And transplant is just such a, a great opportunity to change the course of someone's life. Uh, and so we really need to uh, push that as much as we can. I think you just so, so on that note, Matt. So which was the who? Which team was the champion in the first ever Neff Madness? That's when we didn't really like pair the teams down that well, and transplant just destroyed. I mean, obviously, it just it, it was just not even close. But uh, we've had transplant regions uh, many times, and so I think it has a good shot. Should we go over the, the teams? But, but I just Wait, sorry, sorry. The... I'm I'm dying to say one more thing about PTLD. Oh, sorry, may I say it? <laughs> <laughs> so it is, it is a common misconception that all PTLDs are associated with, with Epstein-Barr virus. And so I wanted to make a PSA that there is EBV negative PTLD. 
And so just because your EBV PCR is negative, that does not mean that the patient cannot have PTLD and PSA. Okay. And then to uh, riff off of what uh, Matt was saying about how effective transplants are, I think you just the, the if you just take a look at the percentages that we talk about in terms of mortality on dialysis, where you're somewhere between 18 and 23% mortality per year for hemodialysis. And then when you take a look at transplant, we're talking about we have 95% graft survival at the end of one year. And just the way you're looking at those numbers, one, you're looking at death and uh, with uh, dialysis. And then when you're talking about transplant, we're saying, hey, 19 out of 20 of these things are working great after a year. It really just kind of clarifies what an amazing uh, medical therapy this is. It really is a, a new life for these patients. Can we move on to Nerf Madness now? What's that? Nerf Madness. So there's a transplant region for Nerf Madness, and we have uh, two uh, pairings. So uh, the first pairing is in relationship to uh, rejection, which we talked about, and this is a, this is a, a, a big issue. So one of the teams is uh, what is it? Is it non-invasive? What, what's the term? Biomarkers, yeah. Biomarkers okay. for kidney rejection versus good old kidney biopsy for uh, rejection. So what's the story with uh, with uh, biomarkers? Yeah, so uh, biomarkers for rejection, the team is trying to um, diagnose a rejection or identify patients that might be at higher risk using either blood or urine. And so um, that's measuring um, cytokine levels, measuring gene expression profiles, um, and just trying to find some way to identify these patients without having to actually do the biopsy itself. Um, and so the, the blog post kind of covers what those different tests are that have been developed, what the data is for them, um, and how they've been helpful. Is this, um, and so, is this future tech or is this something that's here today? Um, so it is not prime time in the sense that I'm not ordering it from my clinic, um, but there is some promising data. And so we may be making some progress soon. Um, and then on the flip side of that um, is the biopsy team, um, which is kind of taking a, a traditional approach of doing the kidney biopsy, but looking at it with more sophisticated tools. So um, the two big limitations that we mentioned earlier are sampling, um, which unfortunately can't do much about, but the second one is interpretation of the biopsy. And so two ways to look at that differently are using computer-assisted techniques to help read these biopsy slides, as well as machine learning. And so um, if we can have a more standardized approach that may kind of get us more consistent diagnoses, which are important not just for clinical care, but also for um, research studies. Um, so those are the two teams in that well, And one of the things section. that on the biopsy that I thought was super interesting was actually using molecular probes, so completely new stains that weren't so dependent on uh, – they, they kind of took away a lot of the sampling problems because if you got medulla, which is normally useless, uh, they were still able to uh, provide useful information in terms of what that kidney's going through, which is pretty interesting. Um, so, Samira, so how – if we were going to use – if we were going to have a blood test to detect rejection, what kind of sensitivity would you need? Would you, would you, would you be willing to miss 1 in 10 acute rejections with a blood test? It would, need, would it have to have a sensitivity greater than 90%? That's a – I don't know how to answer that. That's it's a, a tough, tough one, one, right? Yeah, it's a – yeah. Um, I think the uh, optimal or more realistic approach is that this wouldn't really get rid of the biopsy, but it maybe could be used to identify patients in which you may not have done a biopsy. So maybe those people with stable creatinins without those um, proteinuria changes, and then you find this kind of high risk gene expression profile or high level of chemokine or cytokine, and then maybe you're pushed to do a biopsy that you would not have otherwise done. Or maybe in a patient where the biopsy read is maybe a borderline rejection, maybe you use this as supplementary data with how you might treat them or if you really kind of believe what you find. Um, but I think it's hard to make an argument that these are going to be standalone tests and, and will, you know, decrease the importance of the biopsy. Exactly, because the, the acute rejections um, or rather a biopsy with acute rejection is not a very sensitive way anyways. Right? It, 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 I don't think it's good enough to be held as a gold standard even. Right. Our patients develop chronic rejection because, you know, sometimes we have missed acute rejections that they've had in the past. 
Um, and also, even with the with even if we make a diagnosis of rejection, it is not a hundred percent of the time crystal clear. Is this cellular? Is this antibody? Is it both? And so, these supplementary tools, especially gene expression profiles that may kind of point to one or the other, may again help you with your interpretation. So, is this vasculitis from a, um, cellular rejection, or is this vasculitis that can also be seen with some cases of AMR? I think that's also a challenge. Right, and and wearing my epidemiology hat here, it's it, it, one of the challenges here has been that acute rejection is so rare now. Like we have become so good at preventing rejections that you don't get the outcomes anymore. So it's hard to do a, a trial and show you know this is better than that because you do need a lot of events happening, and you hardly get any events. Uh, so for example, we are part of one of these uh, I think urinary CXCL or one of those biomarkers that they talk about. And and for outcomes, they have gone with uh, um, rejection on a protocol biopsy, because if we wait for rejections, you're just not going to get. We'll get like five uh, in in ten years uh, or so. Um. Okay, so let's do let's do the bottom half of the bracket. So the bottom half of the bracket is um, it's all about marijuana, and so this is is marijuana. Uh, something that's acceptable in a transplant kidney donor and a can- transplant kidney recipient versus uh, does the, it should marijuana usage uh, re- uh, exclude somebody from being a kidney recipient or donor? And so, uh, uh, Matt, you smoke a lot of marijuana. Why don't you talk about it? <laughs> he does not. That's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> I was teasing him. <laughs> most of the time, most of the time, Matt is not high. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so so in, 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 it's legal up here. So you know, if we start excluding marijuana users as donors, I will have no donors in Canada. So are there are there problems with uh, a, a marijuana user as a donor? Is that is that problematic? So the the data so far um, have not shown that kidney um, kidneys that come from donors that um, use marijuana do any differently um, than patients that do not. Um, again, these studies are very limited. They're small studies. They're mainly based on surveys. Um, people kind of checking a box that says they use marijuana or don't. Um, but there's really nothing to suggest that those kidneys are any worse. Um, I think on the flip side of marijuana use um, being not okay in kidney transplant recipients, there is some newer interesting literature coming out that it may not be as benign for the cardiovascular system as we once thought. Um, I think for a long time, um, we kind of said, you know, tobacco, bad for the heart, marijuana, probably okay. Um, but there are different um, um processes that have been described. One of them, I believe it's called cannabinoid arteritis, which is basically like a vasospasm that can be induced um, by um, cannabinoid receptor um, activation. Um, and there's a nice um, review that was in one of the big cardiology journals that's um, we've linked in the NEF Madness post that goes into some of the other proposed mechanisms and kind of really painting this picture that, you know, it may not be as benign as we thought. Um, on the other side, the, the pro marijuana use being okay in kidney transplantation, we do know that it does treat um, many of the symptoms that our patients experience that may be related to the drugs that they use to um, protect their allografts. It can reduce anxiety, can reduce insomnia. Um, so I think it's a, it's a, they're two really great teams that are paired against each other, and um, there's a strong argument for both sides. And the epidemiologic data on marijuana use, uh, the kidneys, it, once you stratify for smoke, uh, tobacco use or no tobacco use, there was no difference in uh, graph survival by marijuana use. Correct. That right? Correct. So, so no hard outcomes to show that using marijuana and with a kidney transplant is going to hurt your graph. And then there, but there is also data that it does interfere with tacro metabolism. Is that right? So the um, so levels. it is a it is a potent so a cannabidiol is a potent CYP3A inhibitor, um, and so this is a more unique challenge than using one of the drugs because if you're prescribed a new drug that you're taking every day, we can adjust your your tacrolimus dosing. If you're using differing doses of marijuana every day, every other day, that can lead to wildly fluctuating levels. We know that that's a, that's a bad prognostic marker for allograft outcomes. So, so it increases tacrolimus level, right? Correct. Uh, but it is um, like some. So, so the idea is that you know if you if you use marijuana and then we did your trough level and then say the next day you didn't, now your trough level may be may be very low. But is it like the regular THC or is it like some potent C? I thought it was only seen with like a really potent CBD or something like that, wasn't it? Um, I don't. I didn't. 
see anything about the uh, potency, but I think it is known that cannabidiol is a potent um, right. um, inhibitor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's no quality control with what people buy, right? It may Right. And actually now, you know, there there is not really um, homogeneity in the strains. Um, what everyone is using can be wildly different based on where they obtained it. So, so stick to your... Uh dealer or, <laughs> yep, or yep. dispensary you dispensary yeah. Yeah. right dispensary <laughs> sorry. stick to the same dispensary <laughs> we're never going to be invited back to Herb <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guest here I'm the guest here I think this is now called the Herb Sun <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'll That's go back weird. to my corner <laughs> okay so let, let's, get, let's go around the horn uh, let's do the uh, the top half of the bracket uh, kidney biopsy or bio was it biomarkers i have the right term biomarkers yeah so what do you got swap um i'm i'm conservative i'll stick with the biopsy samira Um, i'm gonna go with the biopsy i think the new interpretation tools are going to be very helpful a jenny Going with biopsy i like the concept of biomarkers but uh, knowing what these uh, molecules do and i'm not really sure about specificity um, I'm going to be conservative and say biopsy. Matt? I'm going to go with biomarkers. I just like to order things. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on team biomarker myself. <laughs> uh, Cyrus? Oh, man, I love I love new toys. I'm going biomarkers. Yeah, excellent. Three, three versus three. <laughs> okay, and then um, uh, marijuana, okay, marijuana, not okay. Okay, okay. Uh, on in Ottawa, what do you got? Of course, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Samira? Um, I care about uh, patient quality of life, symptom control. There's no data to say the allograph's going to be injured, so I say marijuana's okay. Uh, Jenny? I would say okay, but just be consistent with what you take. Matt? I'm going to say okay, just but remind everyone, it's not legal in the federal government. It should be, but it's not. That's right. It's spoken like a true VA hospitalist. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'm going to also go marijuana is okay. Not mandatory, but okay. Cyrus? Uh, let's go ahead and close it out 100%. 100%. Okay. Will so, any of the Blue Ribbon panel say no? I think this it's going to be a massive yeah. win if they say no. Yeah. You think they will? I think it'll be unanimous. Be I, think it's gonna be, I think it's going to be 9 0. 9 0. Marijuana is okay. That's my okay. prediction. All right. Okay. So then. Um, uh, Swap, you have biopsy versus marijuana. Which one are you going with? Oh, no. yes. I mean, marijuana is fun, but I don't think it's such a big deal. It has to be biopsy. Biopsy. Samira, you have the same decision. I'm also going to go with biopsy. And Jenny, you have the same decision, marijuana versus biopsy. Um, I think patients will care more about the marijuana, so I'm going to go with marijuana. Matt, you have biomarkers versus bi- marijuana. I'll go for marijuana biomarkers. No, I'll uh, <laughs> go <laughs> Add that to the UDS, uh, right? <laughs> I think I, you know, I, I really would like to see marijuana win the whole thing. So I'm going to go with marijuana. <laughs> okay. Cyrus? Oh, man. Um, again, I like new toys. I'm going to go biomarkers. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm having biomarkers win the region. Hey, guys, this has been super fun. Thank you for joining us. Get your bracket in, nefmadness.com. Yeah. M- Matt, when's the new deadline for uh, Neff Madness? It's April 30th. April 30th. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, awesome. I've changed my name to Ann Arbor. I just want everyone to know that. <laughs> Come on. Oh, man. Man, you can't let that one go. I've already tweeted hey, it out. Wanted to, oh, sorry. I, I just want to say thank you guys for uh, for letting me represent the Curbsiders here. I learned a ton. I'm sure that our audience will as well. Uh, this was super great content. So thanks again for letting me drop in on this. Hey, excellent. Okay, that's a wrap. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. And we're committed to providing you with high value, practice changing knowledge. But to do that, we need your feedback. So please send an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Uh, a special thanks to Paul for joining me for this episode and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chumanchu on Facebook. Until next time, 
I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And I'd, of course, like to thank Stuart for composing our amazing theme music, as well as to Claire Morgan of Natalie for doing heroic work editing our audio. And just as a reminder, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. All right. Goodbye. We are excited to announce that the Curbsiders are now partnering with VCU Health Continuing Education to offer CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcu.org for more information.